Hello, everybody, and welcome from us all at the Center for Creative Photography in the Arizona Arts Division at the University of Arizona. I'm Ann Breckenridge Barrett, Director of the Center for Creative Photography and Associate Vice President for the Arts here at the UA. First, it's critical to acknowledge that the University of Arizona sits on the original homelands of indigenous people who have stewarded this land in time immemorial. We recognize and acknowledge the people, culture, and history that make up our community. I want to extend our deepest gratitude to the Frederick and Francis Somer Foundation, to Jeremy Cox and Naomi Lyons for their ongoing connection and support of the CCP. Thank you also to CCP's Director Circle and to our CCP members. It is you who make events like this possible. My colleagues will place more information about the Center's membership program in the chat so you can access that wherever you're viewing this evening. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We are very glad that you're with us. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's program. Mark McKnight on Frederick Sommer, a conversation with Audrey Sands. Mark McKnight is an award-winning photographer who splits his time between Los Angeles and Albuquerque. McKnight's work embraces a queer formalism that simultaneously celebrates and challenges the work of earlier modernists. McKnight is an assistant professor of photography at the University of New Mexico. He was the 2019 recipient of the Aperture Portfolio Prize, among many other prestigious awards. Dr. Audrey Sands is the Norton Family Assistant Curator of Photography, a joint appointment between the Center for Creative Photography and the Phoenix Art Museum. Sands earned her PhD in History of Art at Yale University. She has worked in the curatorial departments at several notable American art museums and has been awarded numerous grants and fellowships for her scholarship, including from the Henry Luce Foundation, the Center for Advanced Studies in the Visual Arts, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Canadian Photography Institute, and the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. Thank you both for being here. I have been very much looking forward to this conversation this evening. So Audrey, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Annie, and welcome to everyone tuning in from home. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. As Annie mentioned, I'm Audrey Sands, Norton Family Assistant Curator of Photography at the Center for Creative Photography, a joint appointment with the Phoenix Art Museum. As you can tell, I'm not at the museum, but I'm live streaming from my home. I wanted to begin by acknowledging the fact that we are now one year into this pandemic. It has been an incredibly challenging time for everyone, and there's so much that we have lost, in particular, our typical means of connecting with one another in person. At the same time, we have all built new rhythms and found new ways of being in touch and staying close and connected. And I wanna take a moment to thank you all for tuning in tonight from near and far, and for the ways you sustain us through your continued interest in what we do. CCP has been closed to the public since March of 2020, and we've been unable to welcome you in person. However, thanks to our virtual platforms and the incredible work of our education and social media teams, we've been able to stay connected with more of you than ever before through our virtual programming, as well as our CCP interactive app. My heartfelt thanks to them and to all of you. I know I speak for all of us at CCP when I say we look forward to welcoming you all back to our galleries, our auditorium, our library, archives, and print viewing room very soon. Before we begin tonight's program, I want to reiterate Annie's thanks to the Frederick and Francis Somer Foundation, and in particular, Naomi Lyons and Jeremy Cox for their generous support of this event. You can visit them at fredericksomer.org for more information on the artist's biography, bibliography, a working digital catalog raisonné, as well as the foundation's philanthropic activities. I also want to take a moment to encourage you all in the audience to submit your comments and questions live throughout tonight's conversation. Our education team will pass them along during our Q&A session toward the end of this program. And now for our program, Mark McKnight on Frederick Sommer, A Conversation. 
Tonight, I am incredibly grateful to be joined by Mark McKnight, an extraordinary artist, a deep and thoughtful craftsman of words, and someone I'm honored to also call a friend. He is joining us from, him, from his home in Los Angeles. Over the past few years, Mark has garnered international acclaim for his exquisite black and white photographs of the natural environment, of bodies touching and entangled, of shadows and skies. His pictures are as much an inquiry into pure formalism as they are a deep exploration of queer intimacy. They invite voyeurism, pleasure, and a haptic engagement with the surfaces they depict. Mark has won numerous international awards and his work is in a number of museum collections nationwide. I should also add that Mark has been extremely busy through this last year. His first monograph, Heaven is a Prison, was published by Loose Joints in September 2020. Copy of it right here. Currently, his work is the subject of a bi-coastal exhibition titled Hunger for the Absolute, on view right now at Klaus von Nixagend Gallery in New York and at Park View Paul Soto Gallery in Los Angeles. For those of you in Arizona, you can also see a commission of Mark's work at the Museum of Contemporary Art Tucson. Recently, Mark's work has been written about in Aperture, The New Yorker, The Los Angeles Times, Interview Magazine, and many other publications. Welcome, Mark, and thank you so much for joining us. We can have the slideshow. Tonight, Mark and I will discuss the legacy of acclaimed 20th century photographer Frederick Sommer, and Mark's long-standing interest in Somer's life and work. One of the first things Mark shared with me when we first met was that as long as he had loved photography, he had been drawn to the work of Frederick, Frederick Somer. And not only that, but he felt Somer was massively under-celebrated and misunderstood. While he was teaching at the University of Arizona, I would often see Mark in our fine print viewing rooms with his students poring over prints and archival materials. On at least one occasion, he brought one of his photography classes to CCP specifically to look at material from the Frederick Sommer print collection and archive. I want to share that on a personal level, I'm so excited about tonight's conversation because it gets at the heart of why I love working at CCP and what we do here, which is to provide access to our collections and fundamentally to animate and empower new voices in photography and the history of art. Our central premise at CCP is to support what happens when you mine the archive. Mark's interest in the work of Frederick Sommer is just one example of the avenues of thinking, inspiration, and scholarship we aim to make possible in our collections, essentially breathing new interpretations and new life into some of the most important work in the history of photography. The Center for Creative Photography was founded in 1975 with the key idea in mind that it would serve not just as a repository for the care of works of art, but as a resource for scholars, historians, and artists around the world. Authors, museum professionals, artists, and students are invited to use the archives for a wide range of projects, including books, bibliographies, films, and dissertations focusing on photography, as well as cultural studies, environmental history, music, and many other areas. CCP acquired the Frederick Sommer Archive in 1975 as one of its five founding archives, preserving the photographer's fine prints, negatives, personal correspondence, manuscripts, and poetry for generations to come. In addition, correspondence from Sommer is found in the archives of Aaron Siskin and Edward Weston also at CCP. Born in Italy and raised in Brazil, Frederick Sommer trained as a landscape architect in Switzerland and New York before moving to Arizona in 1931. For over six decades, he made his home in Prescott, Arizona, just north of Phoenix, where he dedicated himself to photography, painting and drawing, musical composition, writing, and the study of science and philosophy. Often writ written about in the framework of West Coast modernism, Somer's body of work actually defies easy categorization. The subjects of his photographs are incredibly diverse, ranging from macabre aspects of the natural world to horizonless landscapes, to pure abstractions, to surreal constructions of found objects and doll parts. Yet unifying Somer's photographs is an abiding vision, 
a commitment to the exploration of form, texture, and the slippages our mind makes in how we see what we look at. His writings refer not only to the vast bodies of literature with which he was familiar in the fields of philosophy, psychoanalysis, music theory, and aesthetics, but also to his own observations and assertions about beauty in the world around him, and ultimately to the primacy of emotion over the intellect. I have on the screen two photographs by Frederick Sommer, cut paper, undated on the left, and a double exposure portrait of Max Ernst on the right. Now, I know you're all really here not to hear from me, but to hear from Mark. So I'll kick it off. Mark, I just want to start at the beginning. Can you share a bit about how you first became interested in Frederick Sommer and where that interest has taken you? Yeah, I... Um... Yeah, I guess before I do that, I, I wanted to say thank you for uh, both of you for the sweet introductions. And I, I also wanted to thank um, Naomi and Jeremy at the at the uh, Sommer Foundation. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Annie, also uh, Becky, uh, Meg, Brian, Eli, David, um, <clears throat> you and everyone in the broader CCP and also uh, U of A community um, I also wanted to mention how crazy it is. I So I wanted to come out to Tucson and do summer research when I was a grad student at UC Riverside. And like is often the case, I think, with grad students, I just got totally overwhelmed by my own creative practice and had like no money um, or mental space for, for that traveling and research and got pulled like a million directions. So it never happened. And I, I also wanted to say thank you and that I just really owe uh, Sama for bringing me out, um, uh, well, like a year and a half ago to work as a visiting um, assistant professor because it like really allowed me to sink my teeth into thinking uh, more specifically about summer and and spend some time with all those materials and um, in the CCP. So it was, yeah, it was just, it was that connection um, and being brought out there that I got to connect with uh, Dr. Senf and subsequently uh, Naomi and Jeremy at the foundation who were just like, profoundly generous um, with their time. So super thank you just to everyone. Um, but yeah, I I mean, my my relationship to Sommer, I, I, I've been well aware of his work. Yeah, probably since the beginning. If, if I mean, I suspect I, I probably for the first time saw it in a, in a community college photography lecture, but I think it, the work wasn't really, I think, I don't think I, I really fully understood my attraction to the work until undergrad. I, so I studied at the San Francisco Art Institute and I think, so Linda Connor is, is someone that had connections to Sommer and thus lectured on his work with some regularity in a variety of classes that I took with her. And I, I think that's really probably where it began. I, I think also just to speak maybe a, like a little bit more generally about my, my own practice too, is that I think Summer, Summer makes a lot of sense for me, I think for me as a reference. I so in addition to studying with Linda, whose work is so much about the landscape and, you know, sort of like feminizing the landscape, a landscape that has traditionally been depicted um, in sort of bravado, hyper-masculine ways. I think that, I think that she's a kind of a useful context. And so it, it also makes sense, I think, that she introduced me to the work. But I guess I just also wanted to, since I'm here to talk a little bit about my own practice as well, say that like, I think I have a... I studied at SFAI, which I think when I was an undergraduate was super centered on new topographics. And um, like a, that's a, a lot of the work my peers were making. And I think even at that time, I was trying to, I was trying to figure out other ways of thinking about landscape. And so I think people like Linda Connor, and then also I studied with Hank Wessel, who is of course part of new topographics, but in, and to bring up another person that I think is wrongfully kind of canonized, I think uh, his work is so curious and um, and soulful and doesn't entirely belong in new topographics and is so much about a subjectivity 
um, and about a body moving through the landscape um, and and responding to it. Um, that I think, I think he, and then also someone that I studied with in grad school, John Nivola, who's also looking at that landscape, but um, but in I think in some in some similarly unconventional ways. Um, I think all of those people to a certain degree brought up summer at various points. And I guess, yeah, I don't have a straight answer for you, but I think all of these people were pointing me in the direction of summer, who of course is so exciting and important to me because of the ways in which he foregrounds subjectivity as being one of the most important aspects of his practice. And, and in, in a way, in a way also, he, I think he prescribes that for, for a would-be viewer of his work or, or or a potential student of it. And I think that's, I think those are the kinds of things that really brought me to, to his work, I guess. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting that, um, that you have found that his work has been sort of categorized under a cool modernist tradition when if you look at any of his writings he's extremely overt about his interest in um in psychoanalytic theory and in the subjective and in the emotional and um and i think that the conversations that i've had with you over um you know over the last year or so have also helped me see summer in a new way but Fast forward to your relocating to Tucson in 2019, and it didn't take long for you to connect with the Summer Foundation. And in fact, in early 2020, um, you took a visit to Frederick Sommer's home um, in Prescott, Arizona, and you were able to stay actually in the cabin where Frederick and Francis Sommer resided for 61 years. Um, we would all, I'm sure, love to hear about your experiences there. Um, and I have some of the snapshots that um, that you oops that you shared with me from your time there. Um, but yeah, yeah. Can you share a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, first, um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the quality of the pie at the summer. Uh, foundation, Naomi, um, best slice of pie I've ever had in my life, but also, um, and they're incredibly welcoming and it was incredible, but um, I, yeah, I mean, it was overwhelming, um, I think, to, you know, like, sleep in the bed of, of someone that I hold in such high regard and sort of be in... I, I mean, the dark room is an incredibly, a person's private dark room is an incredibly intimate space. And I don't know, um, maybe this is a little too woo woo, but there, I couldn't help but feel yeah. like I was in somewhere incredibly sacred when I was in that dark room. And um, I'm not going to lie, I definitely spent like uh, an unusually long amount of time each night just kind of hanging out in there and thinking before bed. Um, because his work means so much to me. Um, I, I think may, probably if, well, I mean, we haven't even talked about this, I don't think before, but I, it was great to see his trajectory also as a painter and, and the ways in which some of his ideas through painting and even sculpture um, found their way into his photographic practice. Um, that was really exciting, but I think probably above all else, spending time in his personal library, which is just like meticulously organized, um, was really important. And I, because I think, I think that in addition to um, being handed a copy of this actually um, CCP catalog, I think it's called Words and Pictures. I, I think being in his library and also being gifted a copy of that. Talking about this one, Summer Words. Yeah, yeah. And and then the the companion book to that is Pictures, which was which was a sequence that he produced. So I feel like it was that book which which uh, Dr. Senf gave me, um, 
probably right before she connected me to the foundation. I think it was that book and then being in his library that like really facilitated me getting to see more connective tissue, which is, I, I felt like, I feel like his work is so, um, to its credit and strength, so infinitely interpretable, which I think great art is, but, but, with that, there's also so much potential for one to project so much of themselves onto the work. Um, and I I privilege that, but it was really special to be in his library and get to see that I, I do, I think, I think he had what I perceive to be certain kinds of spiritual concerns, like namely his interest in the interconnectedness of all things again that's that's something i had originally perceived in the photographs but that that was only reaffirmed by by the library and by that book i mentioned also i think like his interest in the archetypal in the otherworldly uh like in 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 using photography essentially uh, like a medium that is intrinsically tied to what is like real to do that and and then also his formal concerns universal or existential concerns like birth death rebirth again his interest in the subjective which he it's like it's clear he says it it's on paper and i those kinds of things were were important and they also feel permissive as an artist to read those things like it it, it felt like it opened up more space for me to be more of myself and and also, I think it it really made it more obvious that he was like wrongly canonized. I just I don't see his work in terms of modernism. Um, sure. Were there um, going back to the library? Were there specific works that you found in his library that either spoke to? some pre-existing kind of avenues of inquiry for you or areas that already were influencing your practice? Yeah. I mean, I, I found like, yeah, it's, I sent you that image. Yeah. The psychology of erotic art. I think like that was kind of a mind blower for me also digging around, you know, he had sod. Uh, he, he also had the divine comedy. I just, it, it, it didn't feel not that I, you know, I wouldn't put it past a modernist to have engaged some of those materials as well, but it just, it just doesn't add up to, to I think some of the concerns that people most commonly associate with modernism, which is like pure description, for example, and 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 also um, like visual acuity and sharpness. It's like one only has to look as far as the soft focus nudes to identify that that he, it wasn't just about like camera vision you know it's about it's about so much more which is constructing a kind of poetry and producing producing um images that um that are larger than the sum of their parts, that it's about the kind of amalgamation of material, which is, again, I think that's that book, the pictures half of that companion set. Um, that's like, it's sequenced by him and it's, it's, it's the, the materials aren't organized. Um, they're not sort of fragmented. It's not like he didn't organize it in a way where it's like, you look at all the cut papers and then you look at all the out of focus nudes, they are sequenced in a way that is uh, rhythmic and poetic and that allows for one to read between the lines. And, um, and I think if, you know, if I have an annoyance with the way exhibitions um, or conversations around his work have gone historically, it's that people tend to like want to block the bodies of work off. And I, I don't there's really- like There's the cut paper work, there's the landscape, there's portraiture, there's the body, there are the constructed found objects, but um, but what it sounds like you have found is that his body of work was functioned more as like an accrual and that he was simultaneously exploring all of those different areas at once and 
they weren't seen as separate projects or series, but sort of all part of the same inquiry, I think that's right, in a way. Absolutely. Um, I wonder I, if we could transition for a moment um, to talk about the significance of place and specifically the American Southwest. Here on the screen, we have Somers Colorado River on the left and your untitled photograph of a mountain ridge made this year. Um, and here's another pairing of Somers Arizona landscape from 1945 and your photograph from 2019, the black place. Frederick Somer moved to Arizona in 1931. And as we know, he remained in the Southwest for the rest of his life. The Southwestern landscape and its offerings clearly became essential to his work. Um, now you grew up in Southern California in 2019, you moved to Tucson and now you split your time between Los Angeles and Albuquerque, New Mexico. Can you talk a bit about place and landscape and its significance in your work? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think, I think there is this sense in the Southwest and well, I guess I can speak more specifically for where I grew up in the high desert in Southern California that, that like in the natural landscape, it can really feel like time stands still. And in the, yeah, I think in the high desert of Southern California, you have to pay closer attention to, I, to identify that the season has changed. And I, I think, I think sort of depending on like the amount of rainfall the winter can look like the summer can look like the spring in certain areas. And I think, I mean, we've talked about this quote um, that we were both attracted to uh, about summer. And I think, I think summer is, I feel like the landscapes that summer is making feel sort of timeless or or out of time or eternal or infinite. And I think that that happens like because of aridity and um, and like which allows for the for a certain kind of like decay amongst yeah, so the I was I was gonna raise that top that very topic that decay and decomposition seem to be so crucially important to Somer. And that the quote that you were talking about is from his 1979 essay, General Aesthetics, where he wrote, climactic conditions in the West give things time to, to decay and come apart slowly. They beautifully exchange characteristics from one to the other. Great accommodations take place during the time that this is happening. And so like exactly what you're describing, this reference to extreme slowness and dryness. Um, yeah, I, I think that's something that's attractive to me. And I, I think that, yeah, I guess I already said it, but it's, I, I think, I think the, there's like an aridity that is palpable in those photographs that allowed for him to make photographs of things that are decaying and also a landscape that looks sort of like completely untouched. I, I guess I think specifically about like these images of coyote carcasses that are, they're like almost, they're almost mummified and then the perfectly maintained form of, of as we've talked about the, the uh, jackrabbit or hare corpse. And then, and then I guess also you said it earlier, this like the landscape, which completely lacks a horizon in his pictures. And that paradoxically gives this kind of forced intimacy with the environment that can, that can produce like even a sense of claustrophobia while also suggesting that the landscape extends infinitely, I think kind of out towards a horizon that is almost like it feels like it's like eternally receding away from us. And yet I, the pictures are so organized. And I think for me, that's his brilliance. And I don't, I don't know that I've ever read why he chose to make the photographs without horizons. So to get back to a thing I've, I've said a few times, it's, this is so much me projecting what I want to see onto these pictures. But I, I will say that like, the way that he treats landscape is something that I think I have learned from and, and something that I think I've implemented in my own photographs. Well, you've, you've talked at, at many times about a kind of 
slow looking that is so essential to the way that you photograph, which makes me think a lot about the slowness of time as Somer describes it, and these extremely gradual processes that you can't observe in a matter of, I mean, in a matter of weeks, as the seasons are changing in so many parts of our country right now, it's like from one day to the next, different flowers are opening and closing in different colors, or there's a whole kind of choreography of of bloom, but in the desert and in the dry Southwest, there's a very different kind of temporality. And I feel like in a way what you're describing and what he was interested in was a kind of alchemy, both this kind of very gradual transition from body to earth, but also a kind of alchemy in, in how we understand what we are looking at. Um, so I just, I've included a couple pairings of Somer's work and yours that I feel really explore these themes of decay and decomposition and a kind of gradualness and slowness of time. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, I'm always, it's like, I always use that word decay um, as well. And and I also am always using the word entropy. And, but at the same time, I feel like I'm always using those words as shorthand. And that, and that to some degree, those are words that have never felt entirely appropriate. And like, I think in, in many ways, I, I find that I've incorrectly referred to what I've incorrectly referred to as entropy is actually about describing things that are that are like really kind of in a state of flux mm -hmm. and and if I like to maybe bring in another reference a writer Simone Weil who wrote Gravity and Grace is is she's extremely important to me and there's this section in Gravity and Grace titled uh, decreation it's a it's like a term that she coined and defines as being markedly different from destruction and uh in to to sort of paraphrase her writing maybe unfairly it's about a kind of undoing and an uncreating of of the world and of the self in order to return to something more base or or more pure and of course she's kind of a christ Christian mystic and theologian. So she's referring to God in the Judeo-Christian sense, which is not something that resonates for me entirely, but this notion that we're like always on the precipice of, of becoming or unbecoming or in a constant state of flux, like always returning to, to that from which we came. I think those things are really significant to my thinking and, and I hope it shows in my work. And I, I think it's, I mean, to get back to the landscape, I think it's the reason why the body echoes the landscape and vice versa. It's, I'm, I'm interested in collapsing those distinctions in order to point at some of these broader existential concerns. And, and I think Sommer was doing that in his own way as well. In fact, one of the books that I kept looking for when I was in that library was Gravity and Grace. And um, it's a huge library, so I, I didn't have a chance to find it. Um, and I, I wonder if it's there. But um, we'll have I, to ask Jeremy and Naomi. Yeah, I do. I do wonder what he would have thought about Simone Weil. I, I, I think. When was that book written? Oh God, that's a good question. I, no idea. But I, it was published posthumously, and I know that all of the texts uh, were. So the story goes. The texts were actually supposed to be destroyed up, upon her passing. But um, bless him, uh, a friend of hers um, did not destroy them and instead produced this compendium of all the materials. Um, but they would have, I mean, they were, I mean, they were obviously in existence in, in Sommer's lifetime. Yeah. I, I mean, well, cl there, clearly his interest in this slipperiness between what seems and what is, is seen in so much of his work where, I mean, in his case, he was often exploring this through dismembered carcasses or doll parts or found objects and natural forms um, like these. Um, 
in your case, this exploration often takes the form of an interplay between nature and the body. Um, and here are two totally exquisite photographs by you that I keep coming back to. Um, what I find is so interesting is that both of you bring that to that subject matter an extreme interest in formal optical description, not always as you pointed out, as in the case of Sommer's um, more blurry depictions of bodies at times, but this seems to be, to me, to be a very kind of, very much in line with a California West Coast modernism tradition, this kind of formalism as subject matter, but also seems very aggressively to push against it and insist on a kind of um, surrealism at the same time, this kind of vacillation between formalism and the surreal or an optical ambiguity, maybe I would call it, that seems to play with the uncanny um, hmm. in a way. Um, does that resonate for you? Does that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like I wish we had two hours to talk. I almost don't even know where to start with some of these questions because I, they're, they're like so late. I just want to have such layered responses to them. I, I mean, in terms of my own practice, but also the way that I, I think of, of his. I, I mean, one of the things I, I aspire to myself that I see in his work is the way in which. Um, he imbues things that you know are are like culturally collectively considered grotesque and and but imbues but imbues them with a kind of grace that 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 allows those things to transcend there's i i think i think maybe i mean Maybe it's growing up with a Catholic mother, but I really have this unconscious obsession with redemption, like whether I like it or not, that I and it's it's there. It's like I feel like it's at the center of my practice. And I think I'm attracted to as I I feel summer was in like the redemptive and transformative and transcendent capacity of the medium. And you know, for for summer, that's that's photographing an amputated leg and and making the amputated leg look elegant or or allowing it to propose in its elegance a kind of existential question uh and and for me what what that looks like is is um photographing uh things that are to to reuse this sort of culturally collectively considered untoward things like psoriasis scars or or uh, corpulent brown bodies um, engaged in sex or or types of sex that are considered taboo. It's like, I don't just have a desire to describe those things for the sake of describing them. It's because there's something at stake in insisting on the beauty of those things so that you are first aware of their beauty. The kind of purity in a way yes. of those things, as opposed to or sort of pushing up against a definition of abjection or something like that. Um, yeah. On a really related note, I've always seen your skies as about a kind of sexual transcendence or as, a, as in themselves, even taken on their own as individual photographs, as a really purely erotic space. And of course, it's difficult not to think of photographs by Somers' friend Alfred Stieglitz and his equivalents, um, a series of horizonless sky photographs about which, um, about which Stieglitz said, my cloud photographs are equivalents of my most profound life experiences, my basic philosophy of life. All art is an equivalent of the artist's most profound life experiences. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think this also hints at the proximity of ecstasy to death and, and sort of an exploration of the overlaps or interrelationships between them. Um, I know we've talked about that a little bit before, but could you say a bit more about like the ways that that resonates for you? Yeah. And I, I mean, we've talked about it and I still, I, it's, um, 
It's like this thing that I think exists in the pictures that I fail to wrap language around, which I, I love. And that feels so Sommer-esque uh, that, that the pictures can convey a thing that is difficult for me to fully articulate using the technology of like spoken word and language, um, which sounds like a cop-out. But I mean, to get back to like equivalency hearing you talking about equivalency and then thinking about, you know, Minor White really took equivalence, equivalency and ran with it. Um, and that kind of became White's calling card, which also just makes me want to dismantle modernism entirely because that is so such an anti-American modernist approach to thinking about photography, actually. Um, so maybe that's the larger project is just taking modernism apart. But I... I mean, to respond to your quote with a quote is like Sommer says this thing about, uh, and it's in one of, it's probably in, in that words book, but he says, feelings are the taste buds that influence our lives. And I, and I, and again, getting back to the suggestive, it's like the subjective, it's like, I, and also the suggestive, maybe that was a slip. It's, um, yeah, the clouds are, they are a, a tool of photographic sequencing. Um, they are, I want to use those images within the book I just put out to, as a kind of refrain, as a kind of breath taken in some circumstances, but they also absolutely function as, as a kind of, some of the clouds, depending on what they look like, they function as a kind of crescendo. Um, there's, there's, there is in particular, um, and it wouldn't have uh, probably flown um, to, to put that pair on screen here, but there's uh, in a, a diptych that's in my exhibition in LA in which um, there, there's an image of anal penetration. And of course that sounds um, explicit, but I think if you look at the photograph, it's, it's also really, you know, not to pat myself on the back, I think it's a pretty good, formal photograph, but it is paired with an image of clouds so that you see one body essentially digging into and penetrating another body. But the sort of poetic suggestion is that inside the body is cloud or that there is a kind of transcendence through the act of, of uh, sex and, and that there is transcendence to be found through the erotic and um, to 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 be that guy, you know, it's like le, uh, le petit mort. It's it's I, I'm not the first person to make um, to draw those parallels. That you know that moment of carnal ecstasy is a moment in which we are both uh, the most pure and present, and also almost annihilated. And and that is something that repeatedly I feel happens in Sommer's work. Um, maybe not as l literalized as it is in mine, but I still think it's absolutely there. Well, I want to I wanna hold for a moment while we're on the topic of the skies, because for those of you who don't have a copy of this <laughs> absolutely gorgeous book, you should know that it comes wrapped in an incredibly gorgeous wrapping paper of one of his sky photographs. And in fact, where you talked about having to sort of tear through the body in order to get to the sky as a reader, if you want to actually open the book, you have to literally tear through the sky and engage in this kind of disruption and, and penetration, if you will, to, to even enter the space of the book, which is totally beautiful. And Mark knows when I received my copy of the book, I sat with it wrapped for a couple of weeks and couldn't bring myself to tear through. And then of course, because I'm just like an obsessive perfectionist person took a little razor blade and cut along each seam to try to preserve it as much as possible. But I've also seen on through like Instagram stories of people as they've engaged with your book, a kind of real tearing through that I think is a really intentional invitation on your part, um, clearly. Uh, well, yeah, to get, to get back to Stieglitz, it's like that was a gesture that is just, I or I hoped it would function 
sort of simultaneously as homage and iconoclasm. It's like I wanted to point someone in the in the direction of my thinking. Yeah. I mean, I I am of the school of equivalency. I I I am almost exclusively interested in what images and and sequences of images can represent not not necessarily the literal thing that's being depicted at the same time though you know it's 2021 and there i also take issue with um certain facets of uh photographic histories in particular as you you and i have discussed uh modernism and and so i also wanted to transgress or suggest a kind of transgression of certain histories um and also like i just book people are so uh and you know bless them too but are just so uh such fetishizers of the object and i yeah. i really wanted to i wanted to play with that and i'm glad you opened your book i still have friends that haven't and um and i, I there's something about that that i really love too it's an object and you engage with it on your own time and terms subjectively yeah absolutely i'm just going to move through a couple other slides here um, where I think here you also see just it, it, this is another work of yours just this beautiful sort of vacillation um, between kind of tenderness and violence uh, between a kind of transcendence and a sort of visceral, like textural, texturality, if that's a word. Um, but then I, I think too about how, how both Summer's pictures and yours evoke a kindly, a kind of um, like deadly, I, I don't know if this is the, this is kind of a clunky phrasing, but a kind of deadly erotics at the fringes of the body. So something that sort of points outside of the body, but therefore sort of brings you back to the corporeal and in fact, in a very deeply erotic sense. Um, and separated by nearly a century, um, I find it, there's a, an extraordinary kind of like, uh, like tenderness, like a softness with, with which you both approach the material that you're photographing, while it also hints at a kind of deep, often sometimes disturbing kind of violence or, um, yeah, a grotesqueness, if that's the right word. Um, but unlike Somer, who worked with carcasses and inanimate figures and animal parts and dolls, this is not an area that you tend to gravitate toward um, as much. And Instead, you work with models, with friends and muses in a way. Um, and I'm curious, what is your relationship like with your subjects and how does that factor into your creative process? Gosh, I wish they were here to answer that. They have such a, <laughs> I loved, uh, one of them in particular has a lot to say about th the way I behave when I'm photographing. Oh, but that'll it, have to be our next yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I was going to say, though, like going back to the previous slide, I just I wanted to say that yeah. like one of the things I think that is also always and you were you were touching on this is that there there is like an affectlessness to his photographs, to Sommer's photographs. And and they're just they they feel very straightforward. Right. Like this picture on screen on the left of his it couldn't be more straightforward, but like it's so direct, but but it's it's also an incredibly poetic image. There's another, actually there's another one of these um, chicken photographs where it's, it's like the chicken, uh, the face is sort of flattened out. And so it's looking back at us, you know, and, 
And I was just showing it to students the other day and saying how direct the photograph is, mm -hmm. how it also, because of the way it's photographed and sort of splayed out on the surface in which it's photographed, it starts to look really human and, and therefore starts to point at our own bodies and sort of what, what lies be like beyond our skin and, and, I think that that's where a lot of the the poetry and the pictures lies, and you know, I I think that's something I'm also attracted to is the potential to make a photograph that is seemingly direct that transcends that that directness. But but sorry, getting back to your question though about um, about uh, the subjects of the photographs, um, I mean, I I can tell you that um, they are. Um, one of them, Naemius, um, is is was engaged to and is now married to another friend of ours. Uh, the two of them are are intimate, beautifully intimate, good friends, and also friends of mine. Um, but they were in; they had sort of began a kind of um, sexual relationship, and um, were open to being photographed. And sorry, the question was about the my relationship to them. Yeah, and just sort of how how your relationship with your subjects, with with the people that you photograph, factors into your creative process is that, is that I imagine almost like a like a dance, like that perhaps you have some idea in mind, but that you get to the place where the site that you want to photograph them in, and um, it's almost like watching a dance, sort of evolve sure. um, yeah that's my imagination i'm i'm more <laughs> curious about what in actuality that process is like uh, yeah like i mean it's part choreographed and part interpretive and um i i find that i i many photographers are skilled at doing this but i'm not one of them i i couldn't um i couldn't just be sitting at home and pre-visualize what these photographs would look like i have a sort of um vague attraction to making a certain type of picture and in fact this entire project was born out of a desire to make one picture of penetrative sex because i i you know, as an artist, you've always got this imaginary antagonizer in your head saying things about your practice that you that bother you. And and for me, there was this uh, hypothetical person being like, oh, yeah, Mark McKnight, the guy who's always pointing towards Eros, but never actually depicting it. And I just wanted to challenge myself to make a photograph that was um, penetrative and quote unquote explicit, but transcended those things. Um, and did more. And that's why I made the first picture. And then I realized that there was more for me to unpack. But getting back to the process, it's like, we I, I chose a very specific location, not, not too far from where I grew up. It's a couple square miles. And we would routinely drive out there and it became a kind of stage, a theater in which they would engage in sex. And I would frequently just like the freak that I am, I guess, stood there like a voyeur and watched and at certain points would say, stop. And then they would, they would stop. And I would set up a very clunkily set up most often a four by five while they sat in 110 degree heat and in, in often in incredibly uncomfortable positions and made photographs and, or, and, or I would, I would stand and watch and make just kind of a mental note that I had observed something that I wanted to re-photograph. And then I would sort of reflect on that on my own time and figure out what things I could do as a photographer to make to make uh, a, a certain posture or, or specific sex act sort of sing in a certain way yeah. um, or speak to some of my, my broader concerns about landscape. I thought this was going to go, this topic was going to go in one direction, but instead I'm going to skip over the next slide that I have. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to ask you my next question, which is, which relates a lot to the kind of circumstances of place. And often when I look at Somer's pictures of a decomposing horse or jackrabbit, uh, 
I imagine him on like a blazing hot Arizona day, treading through the mountains with sweat beads gathering on his forehead, coming upon a carcass and having this aha moment. Your work also takes both you and your subjects into the wilderness. And as you describe often in extremely hot circumstances with some discomfort, um, you've, you've told me stories about sometimes hiking four miles with 80 pounds of equipment and, you know, like, which really gets at the physical labor of photography, which you don't in any way sense with your, with the pristineness of your photographs, but you seem to create a world with almost no reference to the built environment. And you just started talking about it a bit, but I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about your process of moving through nature and your process of seeking, of note-taking, or, um, you know, do you record coordinates or light or shadows? What are your reference points? What is that experience like for you? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I always wish I had um, a more, a more specific answer. I, I don't, I feel like I don't just work um, one way. Like for example, with the images of my two friends um, that were the sort of subjects, protagonists of the book. Um, sometimes it's a, it's about um, having a little bit more agency in kind of asking them to do certain things. And other times it's, it's almost strictly documentation. Um, I, I will say that I, I think, and this is probably that um, new topographics training that uh, I, I, I do often keep a camera nearby and do sometimes go on long drives with my camera with the intention of making pictures of whatever presents itself to me. But I think as I get older, uh, more often, what is happening in the landscape is especially because I, I photograph almost exclusively in places of personal significance is that I go, I hike a lot and I walk around a lot. And like this tree, for example, is an example of me hiking. It's, it's probably, this tree is probably three and a half miles up into the mountains. Um, and I, I hiked up there enough that I observed that one mountain cast its shadow onto a slightly smaller mountain where this very noble looking tree stood alone. And it looked like the shadow of that mountain was material materializing and almost swallowing that tree. Um, and I, and so I, I, I went up there enough times and I I'll send myself text messages or, or, yeah, or make a note in my phone that will say where I was, just roughly. I happen to know all these places very well, where I was roughly and and what time of day it was that I saw a given thing. And then eventually, uh, weather permitting or time permitting or energy permitting, I'll hike back up with all my equipment and just wait for the thing to happen. So it's it's almost like set it's like I'm catching the picture um, more than I, these uh, this like photographic language around hunting and gathering is weird, but I snapshots. yeah, I'm not, I'm not hunting. I'm just kind of lying in wait. And then the picture materializes and I push the button, but only because I've, I've become so accustomed to that landscape that I just know it like the back of my hand or something. A lot of sense. We are coming to the end of our time, and I have two more questions for you. So I'm a rambler. I'm so sorry. No, not at all. And like we've discussed before, I think we could have the two-hour or four-hour version of this conversation. Um, I want to turn to the question of pedagogy. Somer was a longtime teacher of photography. And you have also chosen a career teaching photography alongside your practice. Um, I found this beautiful passage that Sommer wrote in his essay, Art and Aesthetics, from 1982. He wrote, there are many ways of seeing, and it is this difference in seeing that has to be respected. The student needs to be shown that he has the right to his sight, and that sight can be developed into insight. 
To not do this is to keep him in the dark, making the same mistakes over again. He begins to attribute an aura of the indefinable to the process, which is not the case at all. Any guidance, any light in the dark comes from our feelings. I cannot see how we could do anything more important than be interested in the education of our feelings. Thinking is a feeling sensing act under all circumstances. And so with that, I wanted to ask you, how would you describe your philosophy of photography? Another two hour question, but in sort of uh, briefer form, um, how would you describe your philosophy of photography and how do you instill that through your teaching? Um, I'm going to read to you back this Frederick Sommer quote from Art and Aesthetics. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, as is customary, I mean, I feel like uh, very beautifully stated. It's just painfully well stated. Um, I, I think more empathy is, is always the big thing. And I think Sommer touches on that here about just um, uh, feeling. I, I think, um, I, I think, I think cult culturally speaking, I think something that is lacking is empathy. And I think that that's something I try to foreground in teaching and cultivating conversations that, um, that, engender our empathy and and uh in terms of broader discussions like trying to ask students not to enforce their ideological positions onto others but to try on the shoes of some of their peers and figure out how they can help facilitate the growth uh that that person's path is already clearly taking them on i think that's something that feels really important to me but uh I, I was looking through notes the other day and um, I there it's mostly garbage when I'm making notes, but I wrote down in uh, in like a notepad the other day, think uh, making is thinking. And I think that that um, it's probably like a summer quote or something and I'm mistaking it for an original thought, but uh, I, I think that's it. I, I think more recently I want to encourage students to make because um, I, to bring it back to this thing about that it's hard for me sometimes to wrap language around my ideas. I, I think making art is a way for me to understand intuitively who I am and where, and where I'm situated and how I feel in ways that I can't always articulate. And I think I want to convey that to the student. Clearly, Sommer was an impactful teacher and his teachings continue to this day, even long after his death. And I would say based on your description that you have some very lucky students waiting for you in New Mexico. <laughs> um, I wanna close with one last question and coming full circle to the uh, slide that we began on. And that has to do with the idea of influence itself. Um, I really feel that we can't have this conversation without interrogating the idea of or the presumption of influence. And obviously you are an artist entirely distinct from Sommer with your own vision and perspective grounded in the 21st century, grounded in your own set of circumstances. How does the notion, now that we've just talked about your relationship for and the your relationship with Sommer and the ways that that has inflected your thinking over the course of your development as an artist, how does the notion of influence operate for you, if at all? And how does Sommer fit into a sort of cosmic constellation for you? Uh, I, yeah, I, I think when I was younger, this notion that I would be influenced um, or admit to influences was, it's like this, I don't know, it seems like this fallacy that we're not in in art, at least when I was younger, that, that one shouldn't be influenced and that the point of art was complete and utter originality. And um, I, I like observing a trajectory in my practice that has to do with um, being influenced by the things that have sustained my soul, 
which is to say other artworks. And um, I, I mean, to, we've, we talked about, we talked about this idea a decent amount and um, I was going back through summer books and uh, to think about this a little bit more. And I found a quote um, or really a cone or a poem. And he writes, all rare things should be lent away. And I have borrowed very freely. And I think it's actually having reading that, I feel like it's sort of, it just identified this thing that I've known all along, which is that the, the true great thinkers and artists uh, are, are willing to point at precedence and to express gratitude for the works that came before them and helped to teach them so much. And um, yeah, I guess, I think it's just another lesson from from his work and from him that um, this isn't something we run from. This is something we gratefully acknowledge. That's really beautiful. On that note, I wanna thank you so much, Mark. And I wanna turn now to any questions or comments that we've received from our audience. And I wanna remind everyone once again that in our remaining couple of minutes, you can enter your comments or questions in the chat box from wherever you're tuning in. I believe that the question will appear shortly. Great, oh, wonderful. The question is from Professor Jihei Kim who asks, who says, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. My question has to do with an idea of ruin or ruination in landscape photography. Um, Mark, could you elaborate on this in your work and in Somer's photographs? Yeah, I I think it's it it feels um well you know I was about to say it actually feels more more in Sommer's work but then I wanted to catch myself and be like no that's not really true I think I think one of the reasons that I really maybe this is a clumsy answer because I'm just thinking of it sort of in real time because if you can believe it I haven't thought about this specifically before um I think so much of of um, like ruination in Sommer's work has to do with architectural surface, and I think uh, this notion of ruination, or 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 again to get back to this word entropy, um, a word that I sometimes take issue with, is happens um, very frequently in my photographs on the surface of the body. But I, I think um, I think that essentially we're pointing at some of the same things. I think that. I think that when, and forgive me for projecting per usual, but when I'm looking at a photograph like this image that's on screen of a of a you know decaying surface um, with with a decaying object, it 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 brings to mind my own mortality and my fragility. Um, and, and the fact that um, I wear a skin, that it is a kind of shell that will eventually fail me. Um, but I think the thing about this photograph is that it's also incredibly beautiful. And I think, I mean, it's kind of perfect that this is the pairing on screen because I think that that image of mine on the right does the same thing. I think, I think, I mean, if I had a picture in manifesto form, it's uh, or a manifesto in picture form. It's this image on the right. It's I mean, it speaks to eros and the body and also archetype and and yeah and what lies beyond the skin of things and um, and points to um, alchemy or or ruination um, in ways that I, I attempt to transcend those things. That was a really wonderful question. Thanks, GK. I think we have a couple more questions from Andy Schultz. He asks, in your time thinking about Somer, what remains a mystery or puzzle to you that you continue to try to unravel? What a beautiful question. Oh. <laughs> You know what it is? Uh, he talks about this thing called pictorial logic. And uh, there's, and 
my biggest fear tonight was showing up and having someone ask about it because I, it's, 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 um, I can't, I don't fully understand it yet. And, uh, and there is, it may be actually, again, to go back to that uh, CCP um, produced sort of two book set. Uh, I, th I think it's in there that there's actually at the end, there's like a Q and A at, it's like at Mills College or something in maybe the late seventies or early eighties. And all of the questions from students are about this thing he's describing in uh, tr where they're trying to understand what he's talking about when he's talking about pictorial logic and he talks about he's he talks about um he talks about the logic of the photographs and he uses all this language that feels almost scientific but you get the sense the entire time that he's also pointing at at um sentience like like feeling and and perception and um and the poetic and um those are of course the, the combination of those two things feels uniquely like a photographic problem and issue, but it seems like he had his own language around it and an understanding of it that I, I, I don't fully understand yet. Well, I think if anybody could, it would be you because you've spent <laughs> so much time with somewhere, but I found the essay that you're talking or the, Q and A, you're talking about the two logics is what it was, I think, titled afterwards, which was a conversation that he had at Mills College, Oakland in 1983. And I think you're so right. Summer was at all times, I think, grappling with so many avenues of thought and so many different histories of thought. And that in this conversation, he at once references Eastern philo like Zen philosophy, as well as the writings of Pythagoras and, um, and then skips over to describe Cezanne. And there's, I think there's a lot to unpack there. So he, uh, he's just like a brilliant, uh, it's very clear. He was just an incredibly brilliant mind and a really um, complicated thinker. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we have time for just one last question. And that is from Neil Peters, who asks, are you inspired by what others don't see or are afraid to see? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I think, um, I, I'm inspired by what I don't see or am afraid to see, but not necessarily others. Um, yeah, the work I'm making, it's, um, there are conversations um, and uh, dialogues that are byproducts and that are inherent to the production of the work. Like, but I, at the end of the day, I think, the photographs are about self-realization and about a curiosity around myself and, and trying to understand, yeah, my, my own relationship to the world more than they are an illustration of uh, a set of ideas or, or something that I need to prove to people. Does that sort of answer? I think it does. I think that's, that's an absolutely beautiful note to close on. We think it all learn a lot from the way that you see the world, Mark. And thank um, you so much. And I'm so grateful to you for joining me for this conversation tonight. Thank you to all of you for who tuned in this evening from your homes. Um, Mark, clearly we're going to have to do this again for part two and we can bring your um, your models with you to hear yeah. their version of the their telling of your process and what that's like. But um, thanks again to everyone. Stay tuned for our future events by subscribing to our newsletter or by following us on social media. And we look forward to seeing you all very soon. <laughs>